Hello to everybody. Welcome to our next innovation talk. I think uh, I have to ask Olivier, but I'm quite sure that this is number six in our series. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, a lot of interesting topics over the last months, and it was really interesting to see how you all ask questions. And I hope that we get a lot of questions again today. Uh, the last talk we had uh, was about creativity. One of the first ones we had was about artificial intelligence. Another one was about data and the usage of data. So we had very different topics. And today, we are bringing them all together. And we are bringing them all together within one mile, or let me say, the last mile. The last mile you have to go until you are at the post box. So what we are talking today now is about the last mile in your marketing and, of course, the post box where this is all going. I just heard that uh, our postal carrier was coming, and uh, about 10 minutes ago, I got something in my post box. So after this talk, I have to go outside and to look what he brought me, which might be interesting. Um, before we really start, I would like Olivier to send a short welcome from the UPU, because the UPU Direct Marketing Advisory Board are the ones who are making all of this possible. So giving over to Olivier. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, welcome to you all from, from everywhere. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it's great to, uh, to see such um, a diverse uh, um, a list of participants in diverse list of countries. Uh, it's fantastic. Thanks to technologies now, we can talk together in, 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 in such a simple way, and that's fantastic. So as Martin said, it's a number six of our innovation series uh, organized by the UPU Direct Marketing Advisory Board. Uh, we are very proud of that innovation series. We are very happy of the success that uh, all those uh, different webinars uh, had. Uh, and, and again, today with the, the number of participants, it's fantastic. We're over 150 uh, registered participants. So welcome to you all. Um, this series was organized by the Direct Marketing Advisory Board of the uh, Universal Postal Union. That's a group of uh, postal operators and uh, a private sector direct marketers that are interested in, in, in discussing direct marketing. Its future is, is, uh, is business, the way we, we do business in this direct marketing space. Um, and, and very interested also uh, talking, to talk about innovations and what, what the, the future is for us. And uh, so you're 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 more than welcome to join our our discussions to join our group. It's an open group. Um, contact us if you're interested to, uh, to work with us on the direct marketing topics. And uh, this last uh, innovation uh, talk today is the last one. Of, I said the last because it's the last of the season before the summer break. It's not the last forever. Of course, we're going to continue uh, given the success we have. But that's the last before the summer break. And what uh, better topic to uh, to close a, a series or a chapter, uh, what a better topic than the last mile. Um, we will have the, the chance uh, to hear two great speakers today, and, and we're gonna have a bit of a deep dive uh, into the, the marketing value of innovation in the last mile delivery. Uh, as I said, we have two great speakers, Jose, Jose Hansen and, and, and Jack Simmons. Uh, Jose, uh, I know him for years, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure that with him, uh, we will sure, surely travel outside the box again, and uh, that, that, that's I'm really working, looking forward to it. Uh, and with Jack, I think we're gonna open the box. So we're gonna go outside the box with Jose, and we're gonna open the box with Jack. So with this, I close my opening uh, remarks. I wish you a very good webinar, uh, enjoy it, uh, and uh, have a happy summer, stay safe, uh, and uh, back to you, Martin. Thanks, Olivier, for not only saying hello to everybody, but as well for making this series possible. And I'm quite happy that you said that we will do this, carry this on. So we should think about a nice cliffhanger in, at the end of today so that you all stay over the summer very interested what we will have to, what we are doing afterwards. Like a good series, you have to have a good cliffhanger, I think. So, but anyway, let's start now. And I'm very happy to have with me already here, Jose Anson. And uh, he, is, um, he has a very interesting title. So he is, um, well, he's CP, CEO, so he's Chief Executive Officer from Upido. But by the way, he is a postal economist. I really like that title. To be honest, it was the first time I ever heard of this title. But I, I think it's interesting to think about postal and economy and to put this together to make out of that a postal economist. 
Here's a, a data guy. He is, is loving artificial intelligence. Uh, he is there for the last mile. He worked for the UPU in the past, but he worked for the World Bank and the World Trade Organ Organization as well. So it looks like he has a not, lot of knowledge. And today he is talking to us about the last mile. So we are nearing the post box. We are not that yet that, uh, there yet, but we are nearing the post box. So I would say over to, to you, Jose, and have a lot of fun. We are really interesting, interested of what you can talk to us uh, today. If you click on the two icons again, you can share the screen, and then we can start with your presentation. And please unmute, unmute yourself. Good afternoon, everybody from Switzerland. Uh, before uh, showing my presentation, I would like to thank... Uh, Olivier, Abby, uh, Martin, uh, for having me on board uh, uh, together with the, the speakers of this afternoon. So I'm glad um, to show how we, could, we can leverage the last mile uh, delivery data for better uh, direct marketing. I'm going to share now my screen so that you can also see the slides. That's it. So last mile to innovation. Let's start with a point. Normally, we end things with a point. We end sentences with a point. But here we start with a point. And why starting with this point today? Because this is one of the main challenges marketers have to overcome. They are still very much working with single points. And it's a pity because working with single points, you can imagine those single points are points of sales, visits to the website that is trying to sell something to someone. But this point is observed, is analyzed with actions around the point. It can be before the checkout, just after the checkout, at the time of paying, but it's all about observing around the point, the point of sale. The problem, looking at the point of sale only, or around the point of sale only, is that you can get a number of things wrong. And uh, a few days ago, the 21st and 22nd of June, it was, again, Amazon Prime Day. And what we've noticed around this uh, shopping festival is that there was a tremendous, a big Prime Day predictive failure. So many marketers, so many market research companies in the US and all over the world have got it wrong in terms of the growth of expected sales during this event. We at uh, UPDO, we developed a product with uh, Last Mile Expert uh, that we call Peak Predict, and it was a great success. We didn't fail in terms of predicting the substantial slowdown in uh, uh, Prime Day's sales this year. You can see here the result of the different models. You have e-marketers that was predicting 80% growth, uh, more than even 18% growth uh, event uh, over event for this Amazon Prime Day. The reality was around 6% and we were predicting 5.5% in the US, so very, very close to reality. Why I want to highlight this for you marketers and, and doing this talk today is because probably what is differentiating us from other uh, prediction providers here is that we just don't focus on the point of sale only. And by not just focusing on the point of sale only, you can overcome the limits of data capture around this sales, sales point. Because basically what is invisible for marketers today is the huge number of miles that are not carefully analyzed by them or they don't get uh, the right analytics or right predictions around what is happening between the point of sale on the one hand, and home or the point of delivery on the, on the other hand. So you have 
these invisible miles to days for marketers. And it's a great pity, I believe, because along this path from the point of sale to home, you can track the parcel, you can track any parcel. And if you don't take advantage, if you don't leverage this information, then you are losing potential signals, potential predictors to improve uh, 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 your modeling of what's going to happen next in terms of sales and in terms of parcel being delivered. But most importantly, here the key is not necessarily about tracking the parcel event after event in the tracking process. What can really make the difference here is not just having the sequence of trackable events from posting to final delivery and to gain greater engagement with consumers to avoid these traditional engagement failures with consumers along the path between the, the warehouse and the final delivery home or out of home or, or as we will see in, uh, uh, in, during next presentation, in a very innovative uh, 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 own box solution. What is critical to really improve uh, marketing data, to improve predictions, uh, predictive results, uh, pred per predictive performance? What is absolutely critical is to track the experience around this movement of the parcel and not the, just the parcel itself physically. And what I mean by tracking the experience is that around these tracking process events, you can observe numerous behaviors of uh, consumers, of online shoppers. Just to give you an example, you can observe how they are tracking their parcel from origin to destination. What is, what is the intensity of tracking at the different points? Uh, how many times are they tracking their parcel in the middle of the process relative to the end of the process, the last uh, 50 feet of the last mile, for instance? So by tracking the tracking behavior itself, you gain key predictive insights on the evolution of consumers' behavior that can help you improve substantially your predictive performance. So what is the challenge now for postal and delivery companies, postal and parcel companies today, is to make all these observation and prediction, potential prediction, fully visible for marketers. It's not just to make the, the, the parcel tracking visible for the online shopper from a physical perspective. It's to make, uh, at each point of this tracking, the behavior of the consumer visible for marketers. And like this, you can achieve a much better understanding and much more um, uh, higher performance of, uh, of prediction related to consumer behavior themselves. And you can dramatically improve uh, the, the experience because finally, uh, what is important in this story here that the best marketing today is this combination of uh, logistics process on the last mile and the good which is being sold. So it's the experience overall that matters for the consumer. It's the good that is being ordered and the service which is provided in terms of delivery uh, experience of this good itself. So thanks to this observation of the behavior, of the tracking behavior of each and every consumer, you can uh, add many, many, many more points to the initial single point that you saw in the first slide of my presentation. You can understand much better many issues around the when, where, and what that will actually be the best predictors of what the consumers are going to buy next, in the next hours, in the next weeks, in the next months. And this is why one of the reasons why probably our predictive performance uh, over Amazon Prime Day was better than uh, uh, the one of a number of other providers. Because basically, you can really leverage all these analyses, for instance, from this double perspective, distance to home of the good, 
moving to the tracking system and time to next purchase. So you can uh, play on crit critical predictive dimensions that will allow you to, to feed uh, uh, and build and design a much better direct marketing campaign, for instance. So instead of being only focused on what is happening on the initial point of sale point. You can also think more about the future and even design what we call sustainable delivery experiences. And by doing so, integrate the concern, today's concern uh, of many consumers that are giving a much higher value uh, to the green impact of their online purchases. So you can not only better design the experience on the sending side, but also on the returning side uh, of goods when shoppers uh, need to return something they bought online, for instance. And what is very important to understand that uh, the more you are able to match this tracking experience behavior with your marketing campaign and the higher the benefits of an experience driven tracking. It's an exponential development of the value of tracking them dynamically uh, the consumer tracking behavior itself and not just the parcel. I repeat, the key is to shift from this focus on tracking the parcel physically only to develop systems that are tracking really in a very smart way, of course, with all the, the, the strengths of artificial intelligence and ma machine learning technologies, to uh, provide the key insights to, to marketers. Now, of course, the, 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 the problems for, for parcel and delivery companies to do so is a big uh, change in terms of culture and in terms of mindset. Because, of course, this requires investments in systems, in smart systems, in, uh, in, 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 in AI systems that allows for this uh, tracking uh, the behavior, the tracking behavior of the consumer itself. So, uh, and uh, it's not enough now just to buy uh, new sorting machines to cope with uh, post pandemic uh, uh, growth in parcel volumes and online shopping. It's also very important. Uh, for parcel delivery companies to be able to feed marketers with this information and predictions. And to do so, they must think if they want to do this internally or, uh, or if they want to, to, to use an external solution. I don't think many postal and parcel companies are nowadays building their own parcel sorting machine. Here is the same. You have a treasure of information, of predictive information around the observation of how your uh, customers are tracking parcel. Now, if you want to really leverage this, you need to, to acquire, to buy the, the, the systems that can provide these insights for, for marketers. Uh, but you have a tradition of relationship with marketers uh, through direct mail that should ease, in a way, the establishment of this relationship and, and the possibility to leverage the opportunity. And in this way, we will make everybody happy. Uh, first of all, consumers that will have a truly experience-driven uh, delivery and uh, marketers, postal and delivery companies who could substantially increase their profit margin uh, in terms of the delivery of parcels. Uh, you know that the prof profitability of delivery companies and postal companies is now a big challenge uh, in order for them to thrive in the future and to invest in a in, in, in new system. So probably the, 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 the room for gaining some additional profit margin in terms of just the physical delivery of the parcel is not enough today. It must be combined with something else but they have been some, this something else. They have uh, trillions uh, of different uh, uh, um, behaviors to observe um, in terms of the tracking use of their system that are 
today absolutely not leverage. So this is why I encourage postal and delivery companies to, to think about these uh, new possibilities, and I'm glad uh, to answer any question today or uh, by email uh, if they are interested in, uh, in um, leveraging uh, this, new, this new use case for their, for their better development today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose. That was really, really interesting. Just to, to be honest, you you just blew my mind a little bit. I'm in, in, in customer relationship management and marketing for 25 years, and I'm into data and artificial intelligence for 15 years now. But I never, I really, I really honestly never thought that something that I click on when I do a track and trace is a worthy, a valuable data for the other side. So I was always thinking this is a service for me and just a cost for the postal operator or whoever is doing that. But you just told me that it's not true, that this is not only a service for me, but at the same time, well, maybe it's a service to, to me, but at the same time, this is a very, very important data source for the other side. And I never, I never would have imagined something like that. It's it's really interesting to think about that. Give me you gave the example of Amazon, and you told us that you were more more precise, able to predict their their the result of their day. So how did you do that? How was well? Which data were this? So how many people clicked on to trace their patch or their parcel, or what is what kind of data did you use to? To, uh, to do a, a calculation, a prediction like that? Well, there are two techniques. Uh, the first technique, where we don't have direct access to the tracking system of a parcel delivery company, is to capture all parcel-related data all over the internet. And mm -hmm. all the parcel-related uh, parcel data that can be related itself to the exercise of tracking. And uh, we were running this kind of exercise all over the world, and all over the world, we get really amazing results. Of course, this approach can be even more powerful if uh, parcel and postal companies uh, uh, try to match our external predictive uh, modeling with their internal uh, data. Uh, tracking data. And uh, what would be even more amazing is that if a number of postal and parcel companies pull all this data together in a safe mm -hmm. manner, uh, to eliminate, eliminate all possible bias, and by pulling together all these uh, tracking data in a safe way, respecting, of course, the right of the, of the online buyers, respecting all rules in terms of data privacy, uh, by pulling all this data together, then uh, the, um, the granularity of the prediction uh, could be uh, amazing at, uh, at product levels or by product category, or by location. So it's just the beginning of a journey. Basically, we've mm -hmm. been doing all this to help uh, uh, post and delivery companies to, to build a more efficient uh, last mile from a, an operational perspective. But we have discovered this on, on, on our way to, <laughs> to a greater uh, operational efficiency. We, 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 we've discovered these key patterns uh, that could be leveraged in a powerful way should the parcel uh, and uh, marketers work together on this data. It's again and again very interesting to see how you can use data where, where you would never imagine of using that data. Um, if you're speaking about the data, um, Walter uh, Trezek is asking who is the owner of the data, the post, the merchant, the addressee, the electronic interface. So is it normally the postal operator or who is owning this data? Well, the question is, uh, <laughs> reverse the question and say, why postal and parcel companies have been giving so much tracking data around to many uh, external systems and startups as well? So all the data today, I would say that almost all parcel and postal companies, in one way or another, with API system, they are uh, giving access uh, to, to, to their data, but parcel by parcel, not... Mm in Overall. a consolidated manner. So you have a yeah. number of startups who have already developed a number of intelligent systems around this connection with, with data. So 
I wonder whether the data is still owned by postal and parcel companies uh, because mm. others are taking advantage of it. It's a very good question by, by, by Walter, uh, of course. And the point is that it's not necessarily about who owns the data. At the end, now the data circulates everywhere. It's mm. about who is able to build the stronger value proposition around this data. Mm. And this is, is where it? there is a long journey for parcel and postal companies to understand that it is not just about buying, buying new parcel uh, machines. It's, buying, it's about, for them, it's about, about leveraging this incredible uh, power of the data that they of are the data in that. from a personal perspective. Yeah. That's a really interesting thought. Uh, probably it's not a, is it a GDPR, a privacy problem, if you have this data, because it's, it's normally person related or or can you use it you, on you, an anonymized, you, anonymized you, level i mean you, we we can work at an anonymized, anonymized level yeah. so a number of uh, for a number of predictions uh, anonymization uh, doesn't create any gdpr issue now for extremely granular predictions uh, you need uh, the agreement of the of the user of course mm -hmm. yes of so, course and at the end if the user gets a much greater experience he might you might be to... even uh, willing to share more. Yeah, but then he would have to consent, which yes. might be a problem. In Europe, yes. at least. Yes, yeah. Um, do you have the feeling that the postal operators, the parcel companies, that they are ready for this data-driven marketing on the last mile? It's not a matter of technology. Technology is available, no problem. It's a matter of mindset. Mm. Are they ready to shift their mindset? to not just being uh, uh, agreeing to, the, to deliver direct mail for marketers, but to, to be in the upstream part of the production of intelligence, not just to be in the downstream part of the process to bring this direct mail to, to everybody's letterbox, but to be really integrated with, market, with marketers at the upstream part. And it's mm. a matter of mindset. It's, just, it's a cultural shift. This is where I invite them to think about uh, this cultural shift because it can increase substantially their profitability as companies. I, I totally agree. Do you have the feeling that they, this, this mind shift is taking place? Not sufficiently, honestly. Not sufficiently, yeah. Uh, there's an interesting question around that from Tamer Ahmed. He is asking, um, what about the, the not so rich countries, the poorer areas? How is it about inclusion? Um, the digitalization is a lot about inclusion and, and giving possibilities to people who had never had that possibilities before. Uh, would you think that this helps at that point, uh, at that uh, topic as well, to, to have more data available? Uh, that could help in this inclusion part? If you, if you want better inclusion, you need to work with better data. This is what I've demonstrated when I was working at the UPU with the United Nations Global Pulse Initiative. We were the first to demonstrate the power of postal big data to improve uh, uh, inclusive development policies. So, 150% uh, convinced that uh, if uh, uh, developing emerging countries uh, uh, approach uh, this uh, data in the way I'm describing, they will be able to design much better inclusive policies. And I think actually what I'm observing is that in emerging developing countries, postal and parcel companies are more open to this kind of leapfrog with uh, um, data than advanced uh, um, postal companies and parcel companies in, uh, in uh, more advanced economies. I think this is a very interesting thought as well. Tama has another question. He is asking about the standards of data exchange in, in this uh, data. He said there were some changes in EDI, M40, well, what is it, M41, M33 and so on. So um, are there some standards out there to, to exchange these delivery data? So is there already a standard for doing this? Well, there are a number of UPU standards for tracking systems regarding uh, international uh, uh, parcel and small packets. Um, so um, they could be leveraged uh, for wider standardization. Uh, probably Walter can also better answer this question than, than I. Uh, in one way or another, what... Um, startups or private companies are doing, uh, those who are working with this kind of data, is that we 
standardize the, the, this data ourselves so that mm. there is a better understanding of what is behind the tracking event. We mm. often have to sort of redefine the standard to make a more uh, relevant use. Out of that, yeah. Final question. Um, if we are looking not for the postal operator, but for the marketeers, for the big brands, for the companies who are using all this, especially, of course, the big uh, ma mail operators uh, who are using the mail, um, do you think that they should rebuild their relationships with the postal and parcel companies to, to get the most out of that? Yeah, they should push. They should be the one that push uh, postal and parcel company to really redefine this relationship. They shouldn't see just the uh, postal company as a, a, a downstream delivery channel for the direct mail. I know that they are already uh, looking for sunset address verification, this kind of thing and other things but they should really intensify the relationship from the upstream perspective, from this data perspective, because it will be a clear win-win for all parts, really. Yeah. I'm surprised why they haven't started so yet, but maybe this is a great opportunity to start. I totally agree. And I think probably if you, if you want my, my perspective, I think they have never thought they can use this data. They are still struggling to use their own data and they just haven't thought that this is an interesting part of the data. And probably most of the postal operators have never, well, sold this data or, or advertised that you can use that data in that way. So I think there is a lot of work to be done. Jose, this was fantastic. I think that was really innovative as well. So thanks a lot to you. Please stay with us because we will have a final discussion after the next presentation. So thanks a lot for doing that presentation and we will have a little bit discussion later on. My Coming pleasure. from that, thanks, yeah. Coming from, from the last mile, we are now going directly to the post box. So I would like to ask uh, Ramesh and Jack to, well, to open their microphones, to open their cameras. Uh, Ramesh is already there. Jack, I see Jack, very good, thanks a lot. So um thanks for coming to us and now we are coming from the last mile to the last meter i would say uh directly in in the front of your your front door um ramesh uh, who is with us he is uh, at the home wallet advisory board as well as uh, at the upu direct marketing advisory uh, no not direct marketing, but advisory board and he was formerly with Pitney Bowes, he, he was with the DMA in the US, he was with Yellow Pages, with AT&T and a lot of other brands. <laughs> so uh, Ramesh, I'm very happy that you are with us. And uh, for Jack, same way, Jack, it's great to have you here. You were working at some startups, but at the, uh, at the same time you were working in CRM as well as you have some political background, which I found really interesting, to be honest. Um, so. It's great to have the two of you here and we are looking for the final meters. And I think, Ramesh, you are starting and then you're giving over to Jack, right, that? Yes. So Good. the floor is yours, the virtual floor, to be honest, but Wonderful. that one is yours. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for those kind words. And thank you to all my fellow UPU colleagues from around the world and the DMAB members for attending today. And a special thank you to Olivier Bussar and and especially Abby Bossart, who works behind the scenes to make us all look good. My job here is to introduce you to Home Valley, and especially let Jack do the talking. As you know, for over the last, I would say, almost 15 years that I've been affiliated with the UPU, one of my main proposals has been that postal operators take unique advantage of their unique operational uh, advantages to, to kind of uh, win in the marketplace. One of those unique advantages is the last mile. And one of the ideas I've been pushing is the, what I would call a rethinking or reimagining of the consumer mailbox to take advantage of this shift of volume from letter mail to parcels, packages, and other e-commerce driven goods. Um, you've also heard me say that in this exponential growth of e-commerce, one category that has been growing the fastest has been groceries, food, perishables, other kind of goods that require features like temperature control, network and physical security. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated all this. 
you know, I'd like to take credit for these ideas and, you know, actually mean credit to Jack and John and, and the guys who created Home Valley. But I have to mention that over 100 years ago, the U.S. Postal Service from 1914 to 1920 had a program called Farm to Table, where the Postal Service actually had a rate category under parcel post for delivering food and groceries from farmers to consumers. And they actually even used to teach the farmers how to do direct marketing how to get customers, sending them mail, et cetera. So anyway, today you're going to hear about something that's the absolute solution to these challenges and opportunities. And that's why I joined the board of Home Valley. John Sims, who's Jack's father and the CEO and the main inventor, patented this concept over 15 years ago. But he waited for the right time to bring it to market. And I believe that he's now going to turn his vision into something that's going to revolutionize multiple industries. Jack, obviously, as the COO, has been responsible for making all of this real, and he leads all the product development, management, and execution of the business in the field with our partners, and I think he's going to talk about some of that. I also want to mention that an old friend of mine, Henk Niemans Ferdriet, who helped me create the smart locker business at Bell & Howe, is also now part of the Home Valley leadership team as the global chief of global partnerships. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jack. Jack? All yours. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, and, and thank you for all your sage advice on our advisory board over the past couple of years. It's been incredibly helpful. Um, I'm going to uh, touch on several things uh, today. Um, and, and I do have a presentation. I'll, I'll get to my slides in, in just a minute. You'll hear a lot about food. Um, as, as Ramesh said, um, one of the big opportunities in, in last mile delivery belongs to several different market verticals that are particularly challenged um, in, in last mile logistics. And, and they're primarily uh, food, highly perishable, obviously. It's liquor, alcohol, wine, and prescriptions. And these are particular challenges for, um, for different reasons, um, not the least of which is security, but cold chain compliance, particularly um, out, outside of the US where, where you know, in the EU, for example, it's five years ahead of um, food safety requirements or about five years ahead of where they are in the US is very serious and, and often requires um, food delivery companies like grocers or e-commerce companies to adhere to a, a pretty strict set of requirements. And those various delivery challenges, whether it be signature requirements, package security, perishability of product, um, are a challenge to customer loyalty. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, Jose mentioned actually a, a key word that we kind of focus on a lot at Home Valet, which is experience. It's that consumer experience. Those challenges translate to a negative experience, which affect loyalty, repeat purchasing behavior, but they don't have to. That's actually, that can be, uh, solving those challenges can be an opportunity to win that loyalty, to, to win that customer, and in fact, lock in that customer to repeat purchasing behavior. Um, digital solutions can actually automate a lot of that uh, purchasing behavior too. Um, but one of the other interesting things that it provides to uh, direct marketers is an opportunity to piggyback on uh, on those purchasing behaviors for new uh, promotional opportunities um, in their uh, direct marketing operations. So let me uh, share my screen here and I'll explain to you a little bit about what Home Valet is about um, and, and we'll unpack that idea a little bit more. So let me see here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this. So um, Home Valet, the, the concept of Home Valet is, is to have a, a smart internet connected, lockable, climate controlled uh, IoT delivery device at the home. Um, this is my family, this is my front porch, and this is a whole bunch of groceries um, inside our smart box. And um, we believe that that superior delivery experience um, can can provide that customer lock-in, provide that customer loyalty, and maintain cold chain compliance all along the way. Um, the consumer has an app where they can 
track, monitor uh, the, the parcel throughout its, uh, its delivery custody, manage the temperature within their box, and uh, view videos of deliveries happening in real time and, and after they occur. Um, this is essentially what we're providing. We integrate with uh, retailers and couriers, and we provide consumers a smart box where these deliveries can go. Um, uh, one thing that this enables in the grocery market particularly could be considered grocery as, as a service. So as you can imagine, um, well, I'll take me for an example. Um, I'm what a grocery brand would call a bad customer. I go to five different grocery stores uh, based on a couple particular items uh, that, that I want. Maybe I want that seasoned pork loin from uh, you know, this one grocer or I go this other place for the fresh vegetable produce because it's higher quality there. But there's a large percentage of my groceries that I buy anywhere that I am because I'm not particularly loyal to the milk brand or the egg brand or the cheese brand, or they just frankly carry the same uh, consumer packaged goods brands at the various grocery stores. So I'll just buy those opportunistically where I am. Um, but as consumers are shifting to, towards pickup and delivery for their own convenience and, and, and freedom and demonstrating a willingness to pay for that experience, um, there's some challenges associated uh, with that shopping experience, not the least of which is, is product discovery. Um, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, these are some of the benefits of, of Home Valet. Right here, this is that last meter. This is where all of those challenges live, right? Delivery windows are a, a real problem, food spoilage, um, theft. And so we're trying to shift the concept of delivery windows from delivery between to deliver by. It allows a lot of efficiencies to be brought to uh, these last mile, last meter, um, as, as Martin said, operations. Um, so that people can aggregate deliveries, create intelligent routing uh, through, through a geographic area. Um, this is particularly interesting for postal service operators who have um, a more universal service to a, a region than other logistics providers do. So this is particularly applicable there. Um, when this is in place, and, and consumers have accepted this. Um, you know, uh, Jose talked a lot about data and what can be gleaned from that data. Uh, one of the challenges for, uh, I, I use the term CPG, um, it's consumer packaged goods, things like crackers and cookies and cheese and things like that. One of the things that they're challenged by is as this shift from in-store shopping to, to digital shopping uh, persists, um, they are losing the ability to promote new or existing brands to consumers because that product discovery opportunity is not there anymore in the store. So they're tr trying to discover ways to put products in front of people um, in a way that is not that expensive um, and can be highly targeted. Um, you know, as you can imagine, when I'm walking through the grocery store with my kids, they see the little cloche full of cheese cubes and toothpicks, and they're definitely trying that cheese. And they tell me I need to buy that cheese. That's a great opportunity for a, for a product brand. Um, and those product brands are trying to figure out how do we get that cheese to this consumer now that they're not in the store? Well, that data um, that we're learning from these consumers can actually inform a very targeted uh, uh, promotion campaign, marketing campaign, that allows uh, logistics companies and grocers to push product to the door without the previous concerns about spoilage, food safety, things like that. So, um, you know, obviously you don't want to blanket a whole uh, neighborhood with cheese, but if you know that that person buys a particular brand of cheese or you know that they have children in their home, you can target that house uh, with, with a promotional product and give them that product discovery opportunity that had been lost. It also is a uh, very strong driver of loyalty. Um, so as I said, those commodities that I'm buying from these various grocery stores, I don't care about the brand. 
if I enter into, um, we call an auto replenishment program, that gives a grocery brand uh, and CPG brands an opportunity uh, to get that repeat purchasing behavior automated for them. You're not reliant on those periodic opportunistic purchasing behaviors anymore. You get a more predictable pattern and thus a higher value customer. Um, another thing you can imagine is, is age restricted items um, as alcohol and, and pharmaceutical uh, companies are exploring more seriously um, uh, digital sales opportunities and delivery. Uh, they need a receptacle that allows that delivery to happen in an economical way, a low cost way. And so what we provide is that auditable system um, that, that allows them to get product delivered and in front of customers without fear of those various challenges. Um, so some of the other benefits, uh, you know, we, we've talked about most of these things. Uh, returns is uh, another very interest, interesting thing, particularly for postal service operators. Um, returns are one of the most expensive parts of the e-commerce delivery chain. And uh, it, it's added cost. You don't want to charge customers for that typically. When, when you can provide a essentially pickup point for products to be delivered back to the distribution center and you give your fleet of vehicles an opportunity to refill their trucks on the way back instead of sending trucks empty, that brings a lot of economies to product returns and postal service operators are there anyway. So they're the perfect partners for these various brands to facilitate um, returns. So that's kind of what we're about. I think that it's a, it's a very interesting world that we're entering in with novel new uh, delivery mailbox solutions uh, coming onto the market. I think that it's going to give direct marketers a whole new opportunity for, for innovative uh, promotions and marketings, uh, marketing opportunities and um, solutions like Home Valet, other automated locker solutions and things like that um, are, are providing that endpoint that make it interesting. So that's it for me. Any questions? Thanks a lot, Jack. This was really interesting as well. And I'm already seeing Ramesh coming to us as well. Let us put on this one on. Um, there were quite uh, already some questions. So, um, but let me let me start first with a with a very practical questions. You have a big house with a big front porch. In at least in Europe, most of the people are living more crowded, and they have flats, and there are probably six or eight or even ten or more flats in a house. So, do you have a solution for them as well? Because they wouldn't have probably the the place to store six or eight or ten of your boxes in their in their their well, in their house our our product go to market strategy is with the device that you see but i readily admit that there are uh, such a variety of different uh residential configurations multi-tenant buildings there are going to have to be and, and and really already are devices that uh, address those various markets the reason that we're focused on this particular type of solution in the U.S. is because 70% of the household inventory, house housing stock in America is single family homes. Yeah. And um, there, there are some decent, somewhat adequate solutions for multi-tenant. You know, Amazon's been in the locker business for, for quite a while now. UPS is in the locker business. There's companies like Smiota that are creating smart lockers. And they're very applicable in urban high density environments. They are less applicable in the suburbs. And um, in the suburbs are actually where a lot of grocery delivery uh, is adopted because the distance between the house and the grocery store is greater. Uh, and people typically have families and live busy lives and have to go to football practice and things like that. So. Um, that's a marketplace that we're very focused on right now, but it will be a product evolution to fit those other niches, absolutely. Okay, makes sense. Another question coming more from the, from the let's say, strategic perspective. We see a big shift, at least in thinking, maybe not yet there, but at least in thinking for the direct-to-consumer market. So D2C is a big topic I see in Europe. 
the big brands starting to 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 look into whether they can do D two C. Um, if I look at this, uh, if I would be Procter Gamble or a company like that, I would think about okay, do I really need the retail anymore? Can't I do direct to consumer if they have boxes like that? So is this something in your your thinking as well? Yes, absolutely. But um, that's going to take uh, some development on on those brands infrastructure as well. They are highly reliant on uh, grocery partners to distribute their products. And so I think while they are exploring DTC opportunities, um, it's going to be at least initially through their grocery brand partners that those things are done. And and I think that they'll drive uh, loyal to, loyalty to their brand as a, as a primary consideration. Um, first before exploring direct to consumer opportunities. As you can imagine, you know, distribution is the big challenge there. And, um, you know, brands like Procter and Gamble, Johnson and Johnson, they have very large distribution hubs, but they're largely intended for truckloads to go to, to grocers. So they need to evolve their own distribution strategy in order to be successful in, in a large scale DTC strategy. Um, Walter is asking, how do you manage risk? Do you know what gets into the lockers? Do, do you send some messaging around? That's, by the way, something Olivier is asking as well. He, I think Olivier is already thinking about buying one of your boxes. It looks like that. Well, so he's asking, whether he, <laughs> he is asking whether he gets a message when something is delivered. So how is this data exchange? I think this, these are all around the data exchange, these questions. How is the yep. data exchange working? So we have um, we have an API platform that allows us to get order uh, information directly from the retailer, and our app provides information to the consumer when, when events happen. Right. So when you place an order on a grocer's website, they can communicate that order and its commodity temperature and security requirements to our platform. And we can take that data and make sure that the unit is prepared to receive that order when it gets there. And so that means pre-cooling the unit in whatever multi-zone configuration it needs to be. If you have a grocery order with ice cream and frozen waffles and lettuce and carrots and canned goods, you need three different temperatures to receive that order. And so as you could see in the picture, that's, that's the configuration that we support. We actually start cooling our unit well in advance to make sure that it's at cold chain compliant temperatures for that retailer. Now, you know, standards are, I mean, they are just that, right? They're relatively standard across uh, grocery, grocers. So we have um, in our platform temperature set uh, that are considered cold chain compliant. And if uh, for some reason the unit is not in that state, we can not only communicate that to the consumer and say, you know, maybe you left the lid open. You know, your kid put a bunch of soccer balls in there or something like that. And that's and a good so they, place for them. Yeah. And so they need to know that stuff. Uh, so not only can we communicate that through push notifications, um, we can communicate that to the retailer too and say, this isn't ready. Or uh, it was ready, but something happened, somebody unplugged it or somebody opened it and left it open. And so you need to communicate to the consumer um, any concerns about food safety. That makes um, sense. In addition to that, I, I see that, uh, uh, you know, Olivier asked, does it connect to your app when something is delivered? Yes, we found that in our um, in our consumer testing, a lot of people found it more convenient just to leave it unlocked if it's empty and we can still cool it and get it ready and everything like that. And uh, we have a little video camera inside the lid that starts recording when the lid is open oh. and we send a push notification upon every access event that says, check out the latest video from your home ballet box. In fact, just yesterday I got a grocery delivery to my house and I could see the person taking the bags and sorting them and putting them in the right place. And that gives me the confidence and peace of mind that things were delivered successfully. In Germany, you, you would have to put a, a sticker on it. You are on camera. Um, yeah, you know, Mar Mar Martin, I want to add one thing to what, what uh, mm -hmm. Jack just said, and that is 
because of this camera, you can actually scan the packages as they're coming in and out. Okay. So if you put like a postal barcode or an IMB code on a, on a label, whether it's a piece of ice cream, a package of ice cream, or even grocery, a bag of groceries, you can actually scan products getting in and out of the box. That's an additional data point given what Jose was saying, incredible mm -hmm. opportunity for postal operators to use their IT infrastructure to create yep. entirely new data streams. By the way, Jose, it would be great if you could come on as again because there's one more question for you. But I, I see here one strategic one for, for Jack again. Um, it's about the, the cold chain delivery and how postal operators, are they the right ones to work with that one? So is this a big business chance for postal operators to go into that business? How do um, you see that? I, I think that as... Uh, distribution centers become smaller and closer to the home, it gives postal service operators a greater opportunity to enter that marketplace. The, mm -hmm. the, the real challenge with food delivery today is that because of cold chain compliance requirements and because of the lack of a solution at home, there's a, there's a very heavy reliance on um, immediacy of that delivery. Right, so it's mostly point-to-point -point gig economy-based solutions um, that are very expensive, uh, for one, and not environmentally friendly because they add a lot of vehicles to the road. So there's a lot of problems with that existing um, uh, dynamic in the marketplace. I think postal service operators are uh, positioned to do this as long as they can provide for um, the food safety from the store to the door and uh, luckily, I don't think that that's a very expensive proposition because it doesn't require any active cooling on their part um, unless they want to aggregate and batch large numbers of orders. Um, but absolutely, I mean, cold chain delivery is a huge opportunity uh, for, for postal service operators, particularly as DCs get closer to the home. Mm -hmm. Great. Jose, there's one question um, that was asked after I switched over to Jack and Ramesh. Um, so I, I want to re rephrase that one. Um, um, there was somebody asking about an example of how to interpret these tracking data. Um, so uh, it, it was a little bit like my question about Amazon. So how did you do this? Um, so do you have an example, which kind of data is giving us which insights from, from the last mile? So can I see, okay, because it was on time, I'm more loyal or what are the, the relationships of data you find? Exactly, this is an excellent example. We can measure precisely uh, the impact of quality of service delivery on the probability of repurchasing the good or having a new relationship with this brand but what postal and parcel company must understand is that they're like a facebook or a youtube without knowing it mm. that is i mean uh, marketers are collaborating with uh, with uh, facebook youtube in order to capture psychological signals personal uh, signals social behavior signals and we cap can capture the same sort of signals by observing how people are tracking their own staff. Yeah. So maybe the post uh, parcel company don't look sexy for marketers from this perspective because it's not a nice YouTube, a nice Facebook, or but 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 actually they have such a hidden treasure that uh, it's uh, still surprising me how they didn't come up uh, with a possibility to really uh, take advantage of these uh, way more substantially than today. And I'm not just I talking think about uh, in the US, USPS. You do the same for UPS, all over the world. For, FedEx, for all regional carriers, for, for, for whoever is moving parcels, as much more in terms of uh, data possibilities than the physical data, uh, parcel tracking itself. I think, Jose, these are great final words. There are a lot of possibilities out there, working with data, working with the last mile, working with a new kind of post box, which is totally um, amazing, to be honest. And I really, I really would like to discuss with the three of you for another hour. 
But even if you don't saw it, see it, we are already two minutes over time. And as a German, I have well to to have a high standard in not being over time. So thanks a lot to you, Jose, for the first presentation. Thanks a lot, Ramesh, for the introduction of Jack. And thanks a lot, Jack, for the last presentation. I, for me, this was, again, a very, very interesting innovation talk we had. And I think you made great points about the last mile and the last meters. So thanks a lot to you. And thanks a lot, Olivier, if you want to come on as well so that we can see you for making all this possible. Thanks to Olivier. And I would say, um, well, it's, it's summer break in a way. So the cliffhanger is, yes, we will do another series. And yes, it will be even more interesting than the last series. And yes, we will have great presenters, but we won't tell you now what they are. <laughs> so that is kind of the cliffhanger, but it will be very, very interesting. So thank, thanks a lot of my, from my side and over to you, Olivier, for the last words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, Jack, Ramesh and, and Jose for this wonderful uh, uh, discussion. And, and I think everybody enjoyed the insight and, and, and the vision and uh, the forward looking type of approach that we wanted to promote for those webinars. And, and really, we, we managed again, thanks to you guys. Uh, we were outside the box. We were in the box. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I wish everybody a great summer. As, as Martin said, we will be back uh, and we will keep you informed on, on the new series of, of, uh, of discussions we would organize within the Direct Marketing Advisory Board. I think it's very important that we have those webinars, that we have those discussions, that we have those talks together uh, because the future is there and we need to discuss it now. So thank you very much again, guys, uh, Jack, uh, Jose, uh, for taking the time to be with us and for this wonderful uh, discussion. Thank you, Martin, for the great work that you're doing in helping us bring that together. And thank you, Abby, who is hiding somewhere behind the cameras there. Thank you, Abby, for your support in organizing all those webinars. Wonderful work. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.